Tonight on Real to Real, come with us as we head to the Jersey Shore to discover why Bishop McHugh of Camden has taken to the sea in Atlantic City. You'll be knocked out when you meet Domingo Petri, an ex-Marine. He has an alternative to the street scene for many kids. And find out why St. Francis de Sales Parish in West Philadelphia is known as the United Nations of the Archdiocese. All this and more tonight on Real to Real. Hello, I'm Monsignor Charles Meinhoff. And I'm Pat Shelton. Welcome to Real to Real. My guest tonight is a, a, a doctor who started life as an atheist, became a Catholic, and her life reads like a wonderful novel. Be sure to stay tuned to meet Dr. Babette Perchance. And on Parish Profile, we'll journey to Southwest Philadelphia to St. Francis de Sales, a multi-ethnic parish celebrating its centennial year, and it's a very beautiful church. And that's also part of my neighborhood, Pat. And speaking of neighborhoods, we went to talk, see a neighborhood of uh, festivity and activity, uh, Ninos Boxaderos. Where do you see them? But Bishop McHugh has discovered a neighborhood in his diocese of Camden, down by the, the seashore. He found out where years ago they used to say there's a cure in the water. But the bishop has learned it's really a wedding of the seas. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says that whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. For the water that I shall give him will be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. It is not surprising then that in the Catholic Church, water is often considered a life-giving and life-sustaining symbol. At baptism, we are cleansed of original sin and given special graces through the waters of faith. The sacrament also permits us to become part of Christ, a member of his mystical body. Although water is usually regarded as symbolic within the church, it is also considered to be one of God's greatest creations. The waters of the eternal sea have been both a source of livelihood and pleasure for many over the centuries. The church, recognizing the dependence of God's people upon the sea, has always sought to acknowledge and bless this wonder of his creation. Atlantic City, New Jersey, has often been called the Las Vegas of the East Coast. Here in the town of glitter, glamour, and glitz, fortunes can be won or lost in minutes with a quick roll of the dice or a turn of the wheel. But it is also here, in this world of chance, that an old and ancient tradition continues to thrive. Every year, on August 15th, Atlantic City celebrates the centuries-old ceremony of the Wedding of the Sea. This ceremony, which is over 500 years old, has been a popular rite in cities and towns along the European seacoast, but most particularly in Venice, where the custom is surrounded by an elaborate ritual. Each year on the Feast of the Ascension, the ruler of Venice is carried out to the sea in the Bessona, or golden shell gondola. Once past the port of Lido, he throws a golden ring into the waters of the Adriatic, symbolizing the ownership and union between Venice and the sea. Although many different legends surround the origin of the custom, there is one which is of particular interest because it involves a former member of the papal office. On Ascension Day, 1445, the Bishop of Servia, Paul Barbo, was returning from Venice aboard his sailboat when a violent storm came upon him. In an attempt to calm the raging waters, the future Pope said a prayer and threw his pastoral ring into the sea. Within moments, the sea calmed, and the bishop was able to resume his journey. The ceremony, which has become an annual tradition in Atlantic City, maintains many of the rituals and customs which have been adopted over the centuries. A concelebrated mass marks the beginning of the festivities, which are held on the Feast of the Assumption, a more appropriate day in Atlantic City with mid-August being the peak of the summer shore season. Following the liturgy, which is customarily celebrated by the Bishop of Camden and the priests of St. Michael's in Atlantic City, a statue of the Blessed Mother is carried onto the boardwalk in front of Convention Hall. After the blessing of the sick and benediction are completed, the Bishop makes his way toward the beach where a lifeguard boat and the current mayor of Atlantic City wait. Once aboard, the journey begins as the boat carries the Bishop into the surf. He tosses a wedding ring and garland of flowers into the water. The rite, now complete, symbolizes the bond which exists between the city and the sea. After the ceremony, many of the faithful can be seen bathing and washing in the newly blessed water, which some believe now has the power to heal physical ailments. 
But whether or not the sea actually does possess the power to heal illness remains a mystery and an extension of one's own faith. What can be gained by bathing in the sea on this special day in August is a renewed sense of the life, love, and faith which Christ grants to us through those first blessed waters of our baptism. Bishop McHugh has found himself a real good neighborhood in his diocese of Camden, Atlantic City, and the ocean. Mm. I hope the children there enjoy the water as much as the bishop did. Yeah, it looks so refreshing. Well, tonight's parish profile features St. Francis de Sales in southwest Philadelphia. It's a multi-ethnic parish celebrating its centennial year. And 20 years ago, my sister Joy asked for special permission from her pastor, you might remember Father John Mitchell, to be married at St. Francis de Sales because it is so beautiful. St. Francis de Sales Parish at 47th and Springfield Avenue in Philadelphia can best be described as the United Nations of the Archdiocese. The parish, which has representation from 21 nations among its parishioners, celebrates its 100th anniversary this year. Founded in 1890, it was established at the request of Mary Bryan and her friends, who petitioned Archbishop Ryan to construct a place of worship in the vast territory of Southwest Philadelphia. The first pastor of St. Francis de Sales, Father Joseph O'Neill, purchased the lot where the present parish buildings now stand in October of 1890. The site was originally part of a property belonging to the old Cherry Tree Hotel. Construction began on a combination chapel school building in May 1891 and the current rectory two years later. In 1903, Father Michael Crane joined St. Francis as its second pastor. Within four years of his appointment, the cornerstone for the present church was laid and the building officially dedicated in 1911. Best known for its impressive architecture, the church boasts a Guastavino tile dome, a landmark which is visible for miles. The dome, which is 62 feet in diameter, is topped with an open belvedere and gold cross. It is covered in white and yellow tiles and features alternating crosses and stars of David. The church, which was designed by architect Henry Daggett, features Romanesque architecture and Byzantine details. It is composed of marble and Indiana limestone and extends 72 feet along Springfield Avenue. In the front of the church building, above the central doorway, is a sculptured panel of the Blessed Mother presenting the infant Savior. The panel, which is flanked by two angels, bears the inscription, My eyes shall be open and my ears be attentive, directly above it. Other panels picture the Annunciation and flight into Egypt. Once inside the church, the magnificent architecture continues. At the base of the central dome stands 24 stained glass windows. Pictured in each are colorful designs which represent various symbols usually associated with the Lord. At the corners of the dome are four symbols, each representing one of the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Directly below the dome on the side walls of the church are the Stations of the Cross. Each station is beautifully depicted in mural mosaic. Resting directly above the stations are decorated panels. Each panel bears the name and emblem of one of the Twelve Apostles, with six resting on each side of the church wall. In the sanctuary of the church stands three altars which are composed of pure Carrara marble. On the right and left of the sanctuary stands two altars, one dedicated to Mary and the other to Joseph. The statues which reside above each of these altars are carved from the same type of marble. A magnificent mosaic mural depicting the crucifixion rests above the main altar of the church and serves as a substitute for the customary crucifix normally present in most churches. Around the sanctuary wall is the inscription, I have loved, O Lord, the beauty of thy house and the place where thy glory dwelleth, represented in mosaic. St. Francis de Sales once said that God is the painter, our faith the canvas, God's word the colors, and the church the brush. And it appears that in the case of this church and this parish, the patron saint for whom it was named was correct. For St. Francis de Sales Parish is truly the manifestation of the dreams and aspirations of the thousands of individuals who have strived over the past 100 years to make the parish what it is today. The church is beautiful and their church music is gorgeous. So that why don't you go by sometime and visit St. Francis de Sales Parish. These moments are made possible for 20,000 more people every year by the Leukemia Society of America.
the Leukemia Society of America. We're gaining every moment. I want you to listen to me. I want you to cross at the corner and look both ways when you're running out there in the street. Because people today, they drive crazy and they will run right over you. And I don't want anything to happen to you because Daddy and I love you very much. Today, the streets are even more dangerous than you think. You like flying? I got something that'll really make you fly. So talk to your kids about drugs, or somebody else will. I have the pleasure of introducing you to a very special lady this evening. She's a wife, a mother, a medical doctor. She's a pathologist living and working in New Jersey. Her name is Dr. Babette Pachance. Welcome, Dr. Pachance. Thank you. It's my privilege. You have a wonderful story, a story that if I were a journalist or a, a, an author, I'd get out a notepad and pen and start making notes right away to write a script about your life. You have gone through a, a crisis in your life that changed you from a non-religious person into a Catholic, and we want you to tell us what was the path to this new life that you found. Well, Pat, I come from an atheistic family. Atheist. And, atheist, yeah. Right. And uh, I went to uh, University of Pennsylvania here and then went on to medical school up at Columbia in New York. and. Uh, there I went through the regular medical school uh, program uh, and basically at that time I was uh, pro-choice by default I suppose and although I was looking for meaning in life really had no direction as far as uh, spiritual things were concerned. Uh, when I became an intern I reached kind of a crisis point in my life. I was married at that time. I was interning at Temple uh, University Hospital here and I was under a tremendous amount of pressure and my marriage didn't seem to be going very well. At that point, I decided to go into pathology. And it was really in pathology that a lot of things changed for me. Because one of the horrible things that I had to do as a pathologist, as a resident in pathology, was to look at the products of conception that came down from the abortion clinic. I see. And although this I- This disturbed you. Very much so. I w was not a squeamish person. I could do autopsies uh, and other things in uh, mm -hmm. medicine, but that particular thing bothered me terribly. I would take the little containers and I would dump them out on the table and I would sift through little broken arms and legs. And I would feel so sick to my stomach that I'd have to leave the room and, and I'd, I'd have to take deep breaths and I'd feel shaky and I'd have to steal myself to go back in to finish up uh, my work. And after a while, I had to come to grips with the question of why was I feeling so sick about this? And I think after a period of time, I really had to come to the conclusion that these were human beings like yourself and myself, only very small and very vulnerable. Who did you discuss this with? Did you just come to all this by yourself or did you have some guidance or counsel? Well, I think the strongest force in my life is my husband who is a Catholic. And although he was somewhat fallen away from the church at the time, he still had a very firm foundation in uh, Christ. And I think he was the one that I bounced my ideas off of. And he was always pro-life uh, during this time. And Did uh, your new position, your newfound position, change your work? Did it interfere with what you had to do at the hospital? In some respects. Uh, I talked it over with other residents. Uh, they didn't seem quite as bothered as I did, but most of the female residents were very bothered by the uh, products of conception. And tell them you at. couldn't be part of that particular phase of pathology? Is, is that well, when I did get to that point, mm -hmm. um, unfortunately I was in a circumstance, uh, actually when I was finishing up my residency at Columbia, uh, where the uh, head physician of that particular department was very pro-abortion and he didn't take a liking to what I was uh, saying. I did finish up my residency and that, that portion of my residency. And this it did result in your conversion to Catholicism? Yes, that along with meeting other Christian people. Mm -hmm. And also you became very active in pro-life organizations, isn't that right? That's right. In New Jersey? 
That's correct. Okay, and what do you do? Just uh, speak to groups and tell them of your uh, uh, new convictions, or how? how what is what form does your activism take? Well, I've done testimony in front of committees down in uh, Trenton uh, for the uh, state government, and I've done talks at various types of churches. Well, I do tell my story, and so I, it's mostly an educational. Yeah, uh, uh, that's right. I've activism. done debates at college, but I think the thing that I'm most drawn to is working with children. I've, uh, Dr. Perchance, I would love to hear the rest of your story. I'd love you to come back sometime and finish it, but we do have to wrap up. But I think everyone understands what you're, what you're trying to tell us. Seeing those little broken bodies made a whole world of difference. Thank you so much for coming and talking with us tonight. And now, won't you stay with us for a few messages? And Senior will be right back. What can you do about AIDS? We welcome your comments, suggestions, and donations and encourage you to write us at Real to Real, St. Charles Seminary, 1000 East Wynwood Road, Overbrook, PA, 19096, or call us during regular business hours at 668-9842. Domingo Petri is a great man. If you don't believe it, ask the Ninos Boxedores. They know because they have learned the man the art of self-defense from a great neighborhood man who has taught them to understand that the talent is all here in this neighborhood. All it needs is a way out. There's an ongoing special event happening in North Camden, and ex-Marine Domingo Petrie is the champion of this inner city neighborhood. Young men from the ages of 7 through 17 are training with full accreditation from the Amateur Boxing Federation. The Camden Destroyers Boxing Club, located at 6th and Erie, is affiliated with the Camden Police Athletic League. Recently, Real to Real visited the popular neighborhood gym, where Domingo told us his reasons for starting a recreation program. Well, the Camden Police Athletic League first originated, started in 1975. Um, it was in existence, but no one knew about it. No one knew that the Camden Police Athletic League was actually here in the city. Until 1976, which uh, there was an incident involving um, uh, several members of my family and uh, two other youth from the city who drowned at the uh, Delaware River. Uh, they made a maple leaf raft and they got in it and the raft turned over and unfortunately all four kids drowned. Uh, ever since then, um, I was trying to find ways to come up with recreational activities in the city. The city had none at that particular time. One of the biggest questions that uh, people may have in mind is uh, why box for a living? Well, when you live in an area like North Camden or like Camden, period, it's a way out for these kids. It's a way for them to come out and uh, it's a way for them to actually see the light. This is the only thing they have right now and this is why they know with me, they come in here, they don't get away with anything. Well, first I get dressed into my shorts and put on my shirt to start shadow boxing and then um, I start jumping or hit the um, the, um, the bag and and then we jump and we go for breaks and sometimes we just um, do um, exercise after we finish and then we go in the ring and do our exercise and then we leave. Uh, we have a total of 45 boxers 
uh, training in here. Uh, recently, we just took a team over to Ohio uh, from here. Uh, we involved the kids from Trenton, and uh, of course, we took uh, some kids from Philadelphia. A total of 16 men team we took out there, and we came back with uh, 11 gold medals. So uh, we really did some damage up there in Ohio. So the talent exists here. There is a lot of talent in here. Although Domingo is the forerunner of the PAL organization, he has had a great amount of cooperation from his trainer, Jesus Hernandez, who recently trained Golden Glove champion Julio Martinez. First of all, you have to beat the national rankings. Like, well, not really national, but like the tri-state, you have to beat the champ state champion and all that, you know. So basically, before I get into um, the team, I have to, you know, get a couple of titles, like national titles or something, you know. So that's, that's what it's all about right there. Isu started uh, out in here about seven, maybe eight years ago. And he developed some caliber, some talent, uh, uh, boxing, uh, boxer from the city. Uh, one of them, Jose Diaz, uh, another one who is here with us today, uh, Julio Martinez, who uh, hopefully will become an Olympian, uh, Olympic fighter. Um, we're looking forward to that in February, and also for the Pan Am Games. Domingo commented to Real to Real that he was ultimately trying to help the children get used to discipline. Because of poverty, these children may not get much discipline at home. So whether you start them out at school age or younger, these child boxers will have an opportunity at becoming fine young men. Well, boxing is one way to express it. There are many, many ways young people express themselves. And it's good they express them now in this World Day of Youth that we celebrate. Right. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Bishop James McHugh, Bishop of the Diocese of Camden. Once again, we begin the annual Respect Life program, which is encourages Catholics and others throughout the United States to reflect upon the sacredness of human life, to think of the many situations in which life is lived, and to stimulate a new appreciation for the value and the dignity of human life. Each year, the National Conference of Catholic Bishops sponsors this program for the many dioceses and sends to every church in the country a copy of the Respect Life Manual. The theme of this year's manual is the celebration of the 25th anniversary of the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world from the Second Vatican Council. The theme that sort of runs through the presentations is that faith throws a new life on everything. One of the great accomplishments of the pastoral constitution was to focus on the human person, a man and woman, in the many circumstances of their lives, to try to focus on human dignity and human rights, and yet always to see the human person in the context of community, of family, of social life, of economic life, to try to relate one's religious principles, one's religious motivations, one's religious commitments to our life in the world. The Respect Life program each year calls Catholics to reflect upon the fact that God has given us life as a sacred gift, as a trust, as it were. We must build respect for life in ourselves and in the total society of which we are a part. We want to respect life from the very moment of conception, in every circumstance in which it is lived, at every stage, right through until natural death. We know that men and women live in many different circumstances. We know that there are many challenges and by far the greatest challenge to the sanctity of human life today is the ongoing trend in the United States of America to destroy the life of the unborn child by abortion. We are constantly told that this must be a matter of choice for each individual. The pro-abortion forces have capitalized on this concept of free choice, and indeed they have limited the choice to only one, and a most destructive one at that, 
the death of the unborn child prior to birth. The church's concern is to expand the choices that men and women have and to always concentrate on life as the central choice. The natural choice is life. Choose life, we tell our people. Choose the circumstances that enhance life, that embellish life, that make us appreciative of the wonderful opportunities that life presents to us. We, might, we want to expand those choices so that the young and the elderly, that the poor and the advantaged, those who have special difficulties or disabilities, so that all of these will have an opportunity to enjoy life as a precious, precious gift from Almighty God. We want to, so, to focus also on human dignity and human rights, and that brings into play the whole of society. Society, of course, does not grant us rights. Our rights are part of the inherent gift that comes from God. On the other hand, society has all kinds of forces and mechanisms that either expand our capacity to enjoy our rights or sometimes limit them. Racism, poverty, disease, lack of education, economic burdens, all of these limit the choice for life. They limit people's capacity to enjoy this wonderful gift that God has given them. The purpose, of course, of the Respect Life program is to emphasize that the choices for life are choices consistent with Almighty God's plan for each one of us. And so as we begin the Respect Life program this year, we want to thank God for the great gift of life that He has given us. We want to recommit ourselves to expand the choices for life. We want to call all men and women to appreciate life, to protect life, to sustain life and to enhance life, and to enable us to live as men and women in community at peace with one another, at peace with the world in which we live, and at peace with all other men and women who share our convictions or who are open enough to be convinced of them. So Bishop McHugh, Archbishop Evalaka, Bishop Reese, and of course Cardinal Kroll, they all teach. They, that's the job of the bishop is to teach. It's not always easy, Pat, but you must be alive and alert to your people and your responsibility. That's right, and even if some people don't care to listen, you must continue to persevere with the message. A, a teacher's big idea and operation, I think though, Pat, is to create a desire to learn in the people. I, I hope as we listen to our bishops, we have a, a wider desire to learn mm -hmm. the things they're teaching us. Many things, this is a very serious issue, the pro-life and the anti-abortion issue, but there's so many things our bishops are teaching us. The oh. National Association, yes. All I ask is that people listen with an open mind, be flexible, have be open in. to maybe a change of thought. As I would say, have a desire to learn. It's a big thing to have a desire to learn, but I ask you to open your mind as well, as Pat says, because the bishops are so alive to what they're trying to do, not just to force issues, but to get us to grow and develop. And so with that, we say good night and God bless you. Good night. Praise the Lord. I'm Father Ralph Chifo from the Charismatic Office. Jesus assures us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And each week at a Charismatic Prayer Group, we experience through sharing, singing, and learning the joy of knowing the Lord with us. Become one of us and all of our brothers and sisters in prayer and the joy of learning about Christ's death and resurrection. Contact us at 668-HOPE.